here lies George Stinney Jr, a 14 year old boy whose life was taken way too soon. Meet 14 year old George Stinney Jr. He is the son of George Senior and Amy, brother to 17 year old John, 12 year old Charles, 10 year old Catherine and 7 year old Amy. The seven of them lived together in a house in Alkaloo, South Carolina. Alkaloo was a small working class mill town where white and black neighbourhoods were separated by railroad tracks. The town was so separated that the children went to segregated schools and everyone attended segregated churches. In March of 1944, 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 7-year-old Mary Emma Thames set out to find Maypops. Now what happened next varies. One version says that the girls were out on their bikes and as they passed the Stinney home, they asked George and his sister Amy if they knew where to find Maypops. The next version is that Mary Emma and Betty June followed the railroad tracks, then walked past the lumber mill where both their fathers worked. They saw George and Amy who had taken their family's cow out to graze. Betty June and Mary Emma asked George and his sister where they could find Maypops, but George and Amy didn't know. The last version is that Betty June and Mary Emma stopped at the house of a prominent white family to see if the wife of a lumber mill boss would go with them to find Maypops. The wife couldn't go, but her son offered to take the girls in his logging truck, but this was never investigated. The girls never came home. Betty June Binnaker and Mary Emma Thames were found the next day lifeless in a ditch in the woods. Both had suffered head injuries, with one report suggesting the injuries could have been sustained by the use of a hammer. That afternoon, only George, Amy and their brother Johnny were at home when two black cars pulled up to their house. Amy, who was playing outside at the time, watched two men walk into the house. Moments later, she watched as her two brothers were led away in handcuffs. Before George was put into one of the cars, he managed to shout to Amy to get their brother, sister and mother. News spread fast and that night, George Senior lost his job at the lumber mill. Then they got word a lynch mob were coming for them, so the Stinney family had to leave. They fled to their grandmothers, taking little possessions with them. Later, Johnny was released and left on the side of the highway. But the Stinney family's nightmare had only just begun. George was questioned by the police alone and without an attorney. Shortly after, Clarendon Deputy Sheriff H.S. Newman talked to the media telling them that within 40 minutes of being arrested, George had confessed. Deputy Sheriff Newman told the media that George had fatally struck the girls after they resisted his sexual advances. When they threatened to tell their parents, George picked up a foot-long railroad trestle spike and attacked the younger girl first, bashing her several times on the head before turning his weapon on the other. Deputy Sheriff Newman also said that George led officers to the spot in the woods where he had hidden the spike. Just 31 days after his arrest, George's trial began. Sadly, his parents couldn't be there through fear of a white mob showing up. They hadn't been able to see him since he had been arrested. The trial took just under three hours and the jury took just 10 minutes to find 14-year-old George Stinney Jr. guilty. Judge P. H. Stahl immediately handed down the sentence of death by execution. As execution day loomed, the governor was inundated with hundreds of letters begging for mercy on George's behalf, coming from all over the state and across the country. People tried everything they could, 
even trying to appeal to the governor's sense of fairness and justice by telling him about a similar case involving a 16-year-old in Paris Island. Ernest Feltwell Jr. had pled guilty to the murder of eight-year-old Diane Tatton in 1943. Ernest had tried to rape the little girl and when she screamed, he admitted to covering her mouth with his hand until her body went limp. Ernest had all the help he could get and received a sentence of 20 years. Despite the public's help, the sentence of death for George still stood. Towards the end of George's time in jail, George met his cellmate, Wilford Johnny Hunter. Over George's last three days, George would talk to Johnny, sing songs and play hide and seek in the bunks. On George's last day, he said to Johnny, Johnny, why do they want to kill me for something I didn't do? Why? At that point, they heard footsteps. They hugged each other and George whispered, Bye. On 16th of June 1944 at 7.25pm, George Stinney Jr. was led to the execution room. George's father was allowed to see him one last time and at 7.30pm, 14-year-old George Stinney Jr. was executed and was declared dead eight minutes later. And on the 17th of June 1944, George's family buried their son and brother. 69 years later, in October of 2013, Mackenzie and Burgess, along with attorney Ray Chandler, who represented the Stinney family, filed a motion for a new trial for George. Then, in January of 2014, new evidence was heard in court. This included testimony from George's siblings that he was with them at the time of the murder. Also, an affidavit was brought forward from Reverend Francis Batson, who found the girls and pulled them from the water-filled ditch. In his statement, he also recalls that there wasn't much blood in or around the ditch, suggesting that they may have been killed elsewhere and moved. Johnny, George's cellmate, also testified that George had told him that he had been made to confess and always maintained his innocence. Finally, on the 17th of December 2014, and to bring this story to a close, Judge Carmen Mullen vacated George's conviction. <laughs>